Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome to part two of uh, Fundamentals of Atomic Force Microscopy. This is a two-part uh, class taught uh, as a part of NanoHub University's uh, initiative. Uh, part one, as many of you uh, have had a chance to take, uh, was taught by Professor Reifenberger. It was focused on fundamental aspects of atomic force microscopy. Uh, this part two is focused on dynamic atomic force microscopy. Before we get started to talk about dynamic atomic force microscopy, I would like to do a brief review of some of the concepts uh, from part one in the class to see how they uh, seamlessly uh, come together with the content of this part of the class. Uh, on the top left is shown a commercial atomic force microscopy instrument. Uh, most AFM instruments are going to consist of uh, a scanner uh, that scans the uh, AFM probe relative to the sample. There's going to be a sample holder and there's going to be a head. Uh, the head of the atomic force microscope contains in it a place to mount a chip containing the AFM probe. Uh, this chip uh, has a cantilever uh, with a sharp tip at the very end of it. Uh, the AFM system itself uh, tends to be uh, of the order of tens of centimeters uh, characteristic length. But if you zoom in to uh, the uh, cantilever itself, it's typically of about the order of magnitude of 200 microns. But if we zoom in further to the end of the uh, cantilever to, to see better the conical or the pyramidical tip formed at the end of the cantilever, the dimensions of that tip are roughly of the order of uh, 10 microns. But if we zoom in even further to the last uh, few atoms at the end of this conical or pyramidical tip, uh, we encounter uh, a region of atoms on the tip which roughly have an order of magnitude of a radius uh, of around 1 to 10 nanometers. And there are about a thousand or a hundred to a thousand atoms in this volume uh, of the tip. And these represent the very end atoms at the end of this AFM cantilever. In an atomic force microscope, what we try to do is to measure forces between these hundreds of atoms at the very end of the AFM tip and a few hundreds of atoms on the sample. Uh, of the uh, on the surface of the sample. Uh, the essential physics in atomic force microscopy is contained in the tip sample interaction forces that develop between these the tip and the sample. Um, and it is in fact due to these forces that we are able to um, image uh, and uh, you know see features and surfaces at very high resolution. Uh, what I've shown at the bottom left of, is a typical example of a force versus distance graph that you have encountered at part one of the course. Uh, F sub TS is the force between the tip and the sample. Uh, D is the gap between the lowermost atoms on the tip and the uppermost atoms on the surface. And what one typically finds is that when D, the gap between the tip and the sample, is very large, these interaction forces are zero. But when D is decreased, uh, the atoms on the tip and the sample start interacting, causing an attractive force, uh, which happens, as you've learned in part one, due to a number of physical phenomena. Uh, a negative force is an attractive force, is a force that tends to suck the tip onto the sample. A positive force is a repulsive force, which represents the sample pushing the tip out of the sample. So as the tip is brought closer to the sample, the forces are attractive initially, and then they become repulsive as the tip really starts indenting into the sample. So we get this canonical, attractive, repulsive kind of a graph shown on the bottom left. Uh, in static atomic force microscopy methods that you learned about in part one, um, one of the key uh, goals was to be able to measure force as a function of the tip sample gap D. However, we learned in part one that it is not possible in AFM to actually measure forces of function of D directly, but rather what you measure is forces of function of Z. So let me step back a little bit here and uh, go over some notation here. Uh, like we used in part one of the class, we refer to Z to represent uh, the distance or the displacement between uh, the undeflected tip and the sample. You can change Z by one of two ways. You could either change Z by changing the location of the sample uh, 
by means of a piezo actuator, which would then change the distance between the undeflected position of the tip and the sample surface. Or you could move the base of the cantilever, uh, which is mounted to the head of the AFM, you can move it up and down and change this distance z. The distance z, however, is not the same as the tip sample gap d. This is because the tip sample interaction forces, FTS, cause the tip to deflect by an amount q. As a result, the actual tip sample gap, d, is the sum of z and q as shown uh, on the top left. Um, and so to understand uh, the connection between the force versus z uh, to the force versus d, uh, a key equation that needs to be solved at different values of z is the equation that's shown, which is the force balance between the tip sample interaction forces and the elastic restoring force of the cantilever. This is what was uh, done at great depth in part one. Uh, the key result, there were two key results that you encountered in part one. Uh, the first was that when you take an experimental F versus Z graph, for example, shown on the bottom right, uh, red is the approach, green is the retraction, you're typically going to observe a snap in and pull out phenomena that as you, as Z decreases, the force suddenly decreases, there's a jump in the force downwards. And when you pull away, there's a sudden jump up in the forces. We typically refer to these as snap in and pull out. Uh, when we use the methods described in part one of the class to convert this F versus Z into an F versus D graph, one of the key things we noted was that there is a whole range of values of D which are not accessible in the experiment. And this basically happens because when you try to bring the tip at certain gaps, the attractive forces and the attractive gradients become so large that they overwhelm the restoring force and the tip snaps into the sample. So there are some gaps or values of D for which you cannot maintain the tip in equilibrium. It either snaps in or pulls out. So we're missing some very important information that can tell us about the forces on the surface between the tip and the sample. Uh, a second limitation of static atomic force microscopy methods is as follows. Uh, the graph on the bottom right shows you a typical force versus distance, a force versus z uh, displacement graph. It turns out that when you try to reconstruct uh, the force versus distance that caused that uh, observed force versus z graph, uh, that there are more than one force versus distance graphs that could result in the experimentally observed force versus Z displacement graph. Uh, on the bottom left, I show an example uh, of a hysteretic for force versus distance model. This would happen, for example, when the tip comes close to the sample and uh, there's humidity in the air and water molecules could condense in the narrow gap between the tip and the sample, forming a liquid neck. Even though the tip itself is not snapped into the sample, there is suddenly a negative force because of the condensation of the water molecules. And then when the tip moves away from the sample, it has to act, oppose, it has to break and rupture this capillary neck that forms. As a result, the tip sample interaction force as a function of D inherently could be hysteretic. However, when you measure a force versus Z graph, you see a snap in or pull out. In static atomic force microscopy, there is no way of finding out or telling if this snap and pull out is due to a large attractive forces coming from the canonical attractive repulsive regime, or is it due to a genuine tip sample hysteresis that happens due to a hysteretic phenomena on the tip sample interface. A third important uh, limitation of uh, static AFM methods is the, the contact mode of imaging that you've discussed in part one of the class applies a constant force and scans the surface. However, if you have weakly bonded samples in the surface, the lateral forces applied by the contact mode can broom or you know push those samples aside. So because of all these reasons, uh, historically dynamic atomic force microscopy uh, was started. Now, the key difference between dynamic atomic force microscopy and static AFM is how one measures these very important forces between the tip and the sample. Um, static atomic force microscopy methods are much like a spring balance. Uh, you have a spring whose 
spring constant you know, you apply a weight, you measure the stretch of the spring, and you've got a calibrated spring, so you multiply the spring constant by the stretch, and you know the force you've applied. Dynamic AFM methods, on the other hand, work on a very different principle. Uh, one takes the AFM cantilever and excites it with a harmonic force, a sinusoidally varying force, and one tunes the excitation frequency to be close to the natural resonance of the oscillator. And so suddenly the cantilever's motion is amplified and it starts vibrating with large amplitudes, um, an amplitude A, and there's also going to be a phase phi associated with it, the phase measuring uh, the lag of the motion relative to the force that's forcing uh, the oscillator. And now in dynamic atomic force microscopy, what one tries to do is one tries to infer the tip sample interaction forces by measuring the changes in the amplitude and phase of the oscillator that happen due to the interaction forces. This is uh, not a very easy problem to resolve or understand, uh, which is why dynamic atomic force microscopy methods, while they have many advantages, have a little more of a theoretical background that needs to be developed. Uh, dynamic atomic force microscopy methods cover a very wide variety of uh, AFM techniques. Uh, they include, for example, the commonly used tapping mode, or uh, it's also called amplitude modulated atomic force microscopy. Uh, in this particular mode, uh, one drives the cantilever at resonance, and it's resonating with an amplitude and phase, but as you approach the sample, the tip sample interaction forces, as I mentioned, are going to modify the amplitude and phase of this oscillator. And uh, the controller in the AFM then scans over a surface, moves the base of the cantilever up and down, so as to keep the amplitude constant, and then the amount that the cantilever has to be moved up and down to keep the amplitude constant, shown in the red curve here, is actually rendered as a topography of the sample. Uh, the advantage of the tapping mode is that you avoid applying lateral forces all the time, so it works really well for weakly bonded samples, uh, for example, in comparison to the contact mode. Another good example of uh, dynamic AFM methods that we will cover in the class um, is the frequency modulation approach shown in the bottom right. Uh, frequency modulation uses a technique where the drive frequency is actually made to change uh, so that the phase is kept at a constant value. Uh, in this case, one is able to achieve very high resolution, in this case atomic resolution, under vacuum conditions. Uh, on the bottom left is shown uh, an example of electrostatic force microscopy where uh, mechanically resonating probes and multiple frequencies of excitation are used to actually map out local charge distributions uh, on the sample. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive list of dynamic AFM methods. There are many others that we will indeed cover in this class, but it gives you an idea of you know, the, the diverse methods uh, that we're going to be talking about, and this is the reason why uh, we decided to have a separate part in this AFM class dedicated to dynamic AFM methods. Now, in order to understand tip sample interaction forces using dynamic AFM methods, one needs to have a model uh, for the probe. The reason for it is because we understand atomic, force, atomic forces between the tip and the sample in dynamic AFM through their effects on the amplitude and phase of the oscillator. So we need to have a good model for the oscillator. Now, what I've shown on the top left is actually uh, an experimental um, animation based on experimental data of an AFM probe. So this is a triangular AFM probe. There are two arms joined together. There's a tip at the very end of it. And uh, what is happening in this experiment is uh, the tip is, of course, on a chip, and the chip is being excited uh, harmonically at a, at, an, at, a, at a frequency that equals the natural frequency of this probe. So the probe is oscillating uh, with an amplitude and phase. And uh, we use laser Doppler vibrometry, which is a method that allows us to measure point by point the amplitude and the motion of the cantilever. And we then animate the whole sequence, and you see this nice periodic motion as this cantilever is oscillating. There are two important things to notice about this uh, animation. Uh, the first is uh, the motion is fairly regular and harmonic, so that's good. The second is the shape of the cantilever is basically the same as it oscillates, uh, in, in the sense that uh, all that changes is the extent of motion at the tip, but as far as the actual shape of the cantilever is concerned, that is not changing uh, during the oscillation. Uh, now, in trying to make a model of this oscillator, 
uh, one has to choose the simplest model possible. We can go into a lot of details and worry about the two arms and, uh, and, uh, and how they join up. But the essence of this course is to try and explain dynamic AFM methods from the simplest physical models possible. And what could be a simpler model uh, in classical mechanics uh, besides the simple harmonic oscillator model, which is also called the point mass uh, oscillator or point mass model. So I will go to the board now and try to show you some of the key concepts behind the point mass model. So an AFM cantilever and a chip are typically uh, of this shape and geometry. This is the chip. This is the cantilever and there is a tip at the end of it. This out here is the cantilever. Now, in order to make a point mass model of this, uh, we can conceptually think of uh, the following pieces. Uh, the tip we can regard as a point mass, shown here. Uh, the cantilever is an element that stores mechanical energy, so we can replace it by a spring or a slinky. Uh, the chip itself is pretty rigid and fixed. So we can replace that by a rigid block out here. And then as this cantilever oscillates, it's going to be surrounded by air and water molecules that uh, apply a drag force to the cantilever as it oscillates, which requires us to put a energy dissipation element in this model, which is shown as a viscous dash pot. Uh, these three elements at their very core capture uh, the basic physics of this complicated triangular object that was shown in the animation. Now, when we deal with the point mass oscillator model, there are three important quantities. Uh, the mass of the oscillator, or the effective mass of the oscillator, uh, the effective stiffness of the oscillator, and the frequency or the damping uh, of the oscillator. So when we make a point mass oscillator uh, representation of the actual probe, we want to make sure that the point mass oscillator oscillates in exactly the same manner that the actual probe does. In other words, Q of t, the deflection of the tip as a function of time, needs to be identical in the two cases for it to be a true representation of the actual probe. And uh, the key uh, basic fundamental metrics that we need to use for this are, are as follows. We want to make sure that the potential energy in the point mass oscillator is identical to the potential energy in the actual cantilever. Uh, as you've learned in part one of the class, the potential energy in the cantilever comes from the fact that as this bends, you're stretching and compressing fibers of the material and storing elastic energy due to bending of the cantilever. And so the spring element must have a value or an effective stiffness k such that the total potential energy, one half kq squared, stored in the point mass oscillator model must equal the potential energy stored in the actual probe. That's how we're going to find out what the exact uh, effective uh, spring constant is going to be. Um, the second important uh, equivalence we want to establish is that of kinetic energy. Uh, we want to make sure that the kinetic energy of the point mass oscillator model, which is one half times the m times q dot squared, or velocity squared, must equal the kinetic energy of the actual probe. The kinetic energy of the actual probe as it oscillates is clearly due to the fact that there's a tip with a certain mass that's moving up and down, so there's a certain kinetic energy associated with that, but also there's a mass that's distributed along the arms of the cantilever as it moves up and down. So it's very clear that the kinetic energy of the point mass model must equal the kinetic energy of this entire probe, which means that the effective mass uh, of the point mass model is not equal to the mass of the tip of the AFM, but rather it is a measure of the overall um, mass of the probe in some manner. And we'll work out the details of this um, uh, in, in the coming classes. For the moment, though, it's important to keep in mind that there's an effective K and there's an effective M. 
And uh, there are physical, fundamental physical principles that allow us to relate these quantities to the actual probe's properties. A final equivalence we want to be sure of, we want to be sure the natural frequency of oscillation of the point mass model is equal to that of the actual probe. So with these, we're able to establish an equivalent or an effective point mass oscillator for uh, an AFM probe. It doesn't matter if the probe is a triangular probe or a rectangular probe, any kind of geometry probe when you drive it at a resonance, you can represent it by a simple point mass oscillator model, so long as we use the correct effective values for the spring constant and the mass. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Before going ahead and talking about the physics of this oscillator, we need to develop an equation of motion that governs the transient motion of the probe. Uh, now, before we try to look into understanding how this oscillator behaves when it interacts with the tip sample intermolecular interatomic forces, we first remove the forces and simply try to understand and review what happens to the simple harmonic oscillator as it just stays there and we ping it and we let it oscillate on its own. That's what is called a transient uh, uh, oscillation. So we'll develop here an equation of motion for that. And what I've shown on the right is a free body diagram for the point mass oscillator model that I developed in the previous slide. Uh, what we show is a tip whose upwards motion of Q is Q of t, and so its velocity is Q dot going upwards, and it has an acceleration Q double dot going upwards. But as the tip moves up, it feels a resistive force coming from the spring, and that force is going to be K, the spring constant, times Q, the deflection. Uh, there is a mechanical, there's a dissipative element uh, with a viscous dash spot in it, and that also exerts a force in a direction opposite to the velocity of the probe, which is going to be the drag coefficient c times the velocity of the probe. And then we simply apply uh, Newton's laws of motion to this point mass. A mass times acceleration is going to be equal to the forces acting on the point mass, which brings us to equation 1, which is mq double dot plus cq dot plus kq equals 0. Uh, as a notation, uh, we're going to use dots over quantities to represent time derivatives of quantities. So q dot means dq dt, q double dot means d squared q dt squared, or the acceleration of the tip. So equation one is the equation of motion governing uh, the transient oscillations of the probe. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with differential equations, this is an ordinary differential equation, a second order differential equation, which means that the uh, highest derivative in time is actually the second derivative. Uh, it's a linear equation uh, because there are no terms involving q squared or q times q dot and so on. And it's a homogeneous equation in that there is no explicit time-dependent quantity uh, uh, sitting on the right-hand side. Or an autonomous equation also, it's often called. Uh, so what we will do in the next class is to try and understand the transient oscillations that come from this simple harmonic or point mass model of the AFM probe. Thank you very much. See you next time.